Anton is from here, from Sacred Heart University, and he is actually our gracious host. And uh, many of you may already know Father Anthony. He has a PhD in theology from Fordham University. His publications include Everyday Mysticism, a book about spirituality in the marketplace, and he co-authored Moral Formation in the Parish, a work about living Christian and moral values on the world. The spirituality written about in these works is reflected in his involvement in lay ministry formation and secular institute movements. He has produced audio and video presentations on Thomas Merton, The History of Christian Spirituality, The Spirituality of Vatican II, Gratitude, The Twelve Steps of Alcoholic Anonymous for Everyone, The Seven Great Scholars, uh, Schools of Christian Spirituality, and A Retreat with Pope Francis. He edited the book Vatican II, A Universal Call to Holiness on the occasion of the 15th anniversary of the Council. His most recent publication is Beauty, A Way to God. In recognition of his ministry in the church, he was given the pontif pontifical honor, which I cannot say this word, pro, pro ecclesia et pontifice. <laughs> by Pope John Paul II in 1999. He was awarded the Caritas Centennial Award in 2000 for his work in lay ministry and the Spirit of Renew, Renew Award for his work in interreligious dialogue and ecumenism. Please help me welcome Father. Thank you. Thank you Great. Now that doesn't count for my 20 minutes, I hope, right? No. <laughs> Hey, may I just use this thing? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to um, acknowledge, as we talk about these sacred texts, that there is a, a bridge in terms of what Rabbi Brockman just spoke about. You cannot understand the Christian scriptures, which we call the New Testament, outside of the context of the Hebrew scriptures, which we often refer to as the Old Testament. It was uh, Pope Pius XII in the 1940s who said that we are all spiritual Semites, uh, meaning that we have a strong bond in the scriptures. And so, therefore, when we talk about the Bible, it's so important that we recognize our bond uh, with our Jewish brothers and sisters. I would also mention the bond with our Islamic sisters and brothers that in the Quran, their sacred text, um, there, are Lord, there are long sections about Jesus, uh, about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and things that we in the Christian tradition hold very dear. So that's the positive. Uh, the thing that's very difficult I would point out um, to make this current uh, during this election cycle that we were experiencing. You hear a lot of people talking about religion, and you hear a lot. And I'm not going to mention names. Uh, you hear a lot of candidates, you know, quoting things from the Bible, etc. And you begin to see where the Bible and the scriptures and quoting the Bible, as Rabbi Brookman pointed out, can become a very divisive thing. Now. Something that we have to be very clear about is this. When we start talking about interpretation, right, and we talk about the Bible, there are various ways in which you can interpret. And that's why I have a great passion on this topic in the academic community that it really is important for us to learn the tools on how to interpret the text. Because if, in fact, we don't do that, these texts can lead to war, uh, they lead to violence, they lead to people killing each other. And so therefore, uh, just the importance of studying texts and having the tools to understand the text as they are meant to be understood. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, the Christian tradition, I'm gonna be speaking uh, from somewhat from a Catholic perspective, um, but some of what I'm going to say applies to all Christian traditions. And the first is this. How did Jesus use the scriptures? Now, keep in mind, Jesus was a Jew. 
I, I tell students this, they're surprised yes. by this. Yeah, Jesus was a Jew. Mary was a Jew. The apostles were Jews, right? So Jesus grew up with the Hebrew Scripture, with the Torah, right? He prayed the Psalms. And so, therefore, when Jesus is quoting the Scriptures, he is quoting the Torah. He's quoting the Hebrew text. So, uh, what Jesus does as he goes about um, quoting the Scriptures, the word that we would use is the word midrash. And the rabbi referred to this word. The word midrash means to seek. Uh, the word midrash is for those who are looking for meaning. And so, therefore, there were two types of midrash uh, in, um, in the time of Jesus. Uh, the first is what we call halakha, the way in which we interpret the law. And the second is hadikha, the way in which we interpret stories from the Hebrew scriptures. Now, in terms of the interpretation of the law, uh, the lawyer comes to Jesus and says, tell me, what is the greatest of the commandments? This is a very difficult question because there was over 600 commandments. And Jesus, this is Halika, he's, he's looking for meaning. He's taking the text and he's bringing it to a new place. And so what he says is the greatest commandment is um, that you should love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, and strength from the book of Deuteronomy and from the book of Leviticus and your neighbor as yourself. What was new about the teaching of Jesus is that he took the love of God and the love of neighbor and he made them one and the same. And you'll see that that strain will come through in what we call the New Testament, right? the Christian scripture. Now, from an academic perspective, and this is very, very important, we have people uh, that spend their whole lives studying the scriptures, interpreting the scriptures, and giving us the tools. So for example, in Jerusalem, uh, there's a place called the Lekol Biblik, where people, scholars, have been working there over the past century, studying and interpreting the scriptures. Uh, in Rome, for example, is the, the Biblicum, uh, where we have scholars also uh, there uh, studying and interpreting the text for us. So there's a lot going on. I'm going to mention this very quickly. When we talk about uh, the, what we call the historical critical method, these are tools that we use for interpretation from a Christian or a Catholic perspective. Right? So the first, we talk about a literary criticism. So when you look to a text, you you interpret or you use poetry in a different way that you would use prose. So you don't interpret poetry literally. You need to know how to interpret poetry. So therefore, when you're looking at text, it's very important to get a sense of what kind of literature is this. The second is what we call historical criticism. That when we look at the text, we look at it in the context in which it was written. So therefore, in the New Testament, <coughs> written in the first century, uh, first century Judaism had a particular way of looking at women, uh, had a particular way of talking about God, etc. That as the scriptures or as our theology has evolved over the centuries, uh, we understand that historical context and we build on it. We're not frozen in that point in time but we understand the context in which it was written. The third is what we call source criticism. So when you look to, even what the rabbi was quoting from the book of Genesis, there's all these sources that were floating around. So when you look at a text, you need to understand what all these sources are before you can begin to uh, interpret. And finally, what we call is redaction criticism. Redaction criticism means what was the agenda of the writer of a particular text? So for example, in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew is writing to Jews, the first Jews, who became Christian. So when you read his text, he's trying to root this new religion of Christianity very clearly in its Jewish background. He has a particular agenda. Now, I say all of this 
because it's very easy to pick up the Bible and turn to this page. Look what it says here. Well, it ain't so simple, right? And therefore, it's important that we understand the complexity or the tools that are needed for interpretation. Now, having said all of this, uh, several years ago, uh, Pope Benedict had a synod of all of the bishops to discuss the Bible. And briefly, uh, a couple of things that they said. They said that the Bible is the symphony of God's word. It's like music. And what they said is, you should never take a single page out of the Bible and look only there. You need to look at the whole text to understand the overriding message. The second thing that they said that was so important, that Christianity is not a religion of a book. Christianity is a religion of the word, meaning that from our perspective, we read the scriptures to deepen or come to know our relationship with the Lord. So our understanding or our reading of the text is really meant to be relational in terms of our life of discipleship. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk quickly about a couple of texts. The story of the Good Samaritan. Now, this particular story uh, that comes from the Gospel of Luke, right? Jesus very often spoke in stories. He spoke in parables, meaning that you need to go beneath the surface to understand the deeper meaning. Uh, the example I always like to use is, how many of you believe in Santa Claus? Okay, just me, no problem. Uh, of course there's a Santa Claus. Of course, right? Uh, we call this, on, on the level of the first naivete, means Santa Claus is the reindeers and all that stuff. But on the deeper level, Santa Claus is every day. They say there's three stages in life. The first stage in life, you believe in Santa Claus. The second stage in life, you start acting like Santa Claus. The third stage of life, you start looking like Santa Claus, right? <laughs> so what it is, you get into the deeper meaning. So these parables are stories that are leading us to a deeper place. Now, this particular text, let's quickly look at this. That because he wanted to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who was my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man fell to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped and beat him, and they went off, leaving him half dead. A priest, which by the way, when I was in grammar school, the sister said that certainly was not a Catholic priest. I don't know what religion. <laughs> a priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Now, this story of Jesus very much captures the Christian ethic, and it is a text that really, I, I feel, gives a, a very uh, poignant um, uh, presentation of the basic truth of Christianity. And this text is one that brings all religions together. It unites. Why? So uh, you have the man who's laying along the road. The people that pass by, first is the priest, right? And the priest, rightfully so, cast him out because according to Jewish law, if he stopped to help this man and touch him, all right, because he was not a Jew, he would have been impure, impure and would not have been worthy to offer sacrifice in the temple. And so too with the Levite when he passed him by. So they were going according to the law. Who was it that helps the man? It's the Samaritan. Now, in first century Judaism, the Samaritans were looked upon as 
half-baked Jews. They, they were not accepted. They didn't worship in the temple in Jerusalem. So they were looked down upon. So what Luke is presenting in this text is that the person that you say doesn't count, right? This is the person who comes to our rescue, you see? Now, something that's very important, in the end of this text, St. Luke says, go and do likewise. The only other time that this is said in the Gospel of Luke is when Jesus gives the Eucharist. He says, do this in memory of me. So this text, is that, is that time five minutes? Six minutes. Oh, six, six minutes, okay, very good. This text is a Eucharistic text. We receive Eucharist, we receive the bread and the wine, but we also receive Eucharist when we help the other, you see? So this is a text that gets us into the border crossing that invites the other, especially those among us whom we would see as being different and those among us whom we might despise. Jesus breaks down the barriers. Now, having said that, we deal with other texts all right, in the Bible. If you take some of these other texts literally, it can be kind of scary. And this is where if you turn to a page and you look at this, and there are extremists, and we call them fundamentalists, who in fact would take this stuff literally, right? So in this instance, from the Gospel of Matthew, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes than to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, that's a very harsh text. Now, when you look at the harsh text, five minutes, okay, when you look at the harsh text, that someone who's looking at it literally, this gives them license to act harshly, right? To begin to treat others in a violent kind of way. Now, the real meaning of the text uh, from Matthew was not to lead us to violence, but really what it was guarding the community against those who would abuse power and those who would abuse sex within the community. Basically, he's using what we would say in the English language, hyperbole, a form of exaggeration to get the point across. Not meant to be taken literally, but really as a way of getting the message across to the community, right? Uh, another text. And if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So you look at this, you say, my goodness, this means we have to hate somebody? So the actual word hate is in there. So, Taken literally, I'm supposed to hate my mother and father. Don't hate your mother and father, they're paying the tuition bills, right? So I hate your mother and father, they're paying the bills, right? But really, the point in, in Luke's gospel here, again, it's not to be taken literally, but basically what it's saying is, again, a form of hyperbole, that to be a disciple of, of Jesus, to follow this way that's described in the story of the Good Samaritan, very often it's going to put us at odds with people in our culture and sometimes even those with whom we are the closest, you see? And again, not meant to be taken literally. I'll just give one more example. Do not think I have come to bring peace on earth. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own house. Now, in the Middle Ages, people took this text, right, that saying, I didn't come to bring peace on here, and they went to the Crusades to say, taken literally, this gives people license to go to war, to kill. And it's really not the meaning of the text. That very simply, what, uh, what Matthew was saying in this text is that, in fact, in living this way of the gospel, that very often families did break up in the first century. Families did break up over this new way, right? And so, therefore, 
what he's saying is that in fact it's not setting people against one another but very often when you're living by a different set of values, it puts you in another kind of category. This is a very brief and superficial interpretation, but it's an example I want to give you of looking at the historical context, looking at the type of language, and to be extremely careful of a literal interpretation that doesn't consider the type of literature, the background, the sources, and the intent of the author. And my time is up. <laughs> okay, <very good. laughs>